Smallpox, in fact, had a rather terrifying name in the early days. It used to be called the speckled monster, and we'll see why in a minute. So smallpox has got the good and the bad. The good is that perhaps, perhaps, it's not around anymore, although we don't altogether know. But the other thing is, as we'll see towards the end of this lecture, issues of immunization are coming up again. And you can't miss them if you look online, read the press, television, or whatever. So we'll see why. No answers here, really, but at least we'll be bringing up some questions. Okay, so the speckled monster, what are we talking about? Well, here's what we're talking about, and it's horrible. As you can see, this is not like a mild case of chickenpox or measles. It's really horrible. And here is a poor child, little girl, in Bangladesh in the 1960s. Notice the date, that's important. We'll see why later. She probably did survive because, weirdly, the more lesions you got on the skin, I don't know how this works, the more likely you actually were to survive. Nobody quite knows exactly why that's the case. But as you can see, plainly, not just a few lumps or pimples here and there, a really horrible one. So the reason I'm showing you this is just to explain to you that because this was such a horrible disease, of course it gave a lot of incentive to do something about it. There wasn't nearly so much incentive to do something about chickenpox, for example. I don't know if any of you have actually had it, but if you have, I know you can immunize against it these days. It's pretty minor. So there really wouldn't be much incentive to start out a huge immunization program against something that just maybe you know, made children a little bit sick for a couple of days. But as you can see from this picture, this went way beyond that. However, on the other side of the fence, you might say, we've had current media reports for the last few years about whether immunization is strictly speaking necessary. Don't we, what I said before, don't we have our own immune system? Are we just putting toxic waste? This is very extreme, I might say. Not many people actually are as extreme as this. Um, into our children, what are we doing? Is this, and this is a current issue at the moment, um, I can't talk about it because it's actually kind of in confidence at the moment, but there's been a PhD done at a university not very far away from here, uh, not so long ago, actually claiming that immunization is to do with um, pharmaceutical companies. They're always the baddies, of course, aren't they, when we don't like them? But it's to do with them pushing the notion that vaccine needs to be made and needs to be spread. So, in fact, this has become a, an academic topic and perhaps strangely um, ideological, you might say. Maybe not all that much medical in it. But it's certainly still very current. We'll come back to that later. Okay, so very brief history, just in case you're not completely sure about what smallpox actually is, because fortunately your generation probably won't have come across it, although previous generations certainly did. A very, very old problem. Um, there was a medical writer, his writings are uh, still available today in translation if you're interested. His name was Razes, you can see his dates there, the, the, um, in the common era, 860 to 932, born in Iran, it would be now Persia, as it was called then. This is, of course, a very, a very um, idealized picture, probably from the 19th century, of how he might have looked um, as he was doing his experiments, as it were. Um, he wrote a treatise on smallpox, which is still available today if you want to read it. The trouble is that in those days, of course, you all know now that how were, how were problems diagnosed? They were diagnosed by external symptoms, weren't they? not by looking inside the body, because you couldn't do that. So we're not quite clear if he was talking about what we would call smallpox, or perhaps some combination of measles or chickenpox or even scarlet fever, all of which, were in, as we know, are infectious diseases, and can get worse or better at different times, as we'll see. However, the general consensus seems to be that it was smallpox he was talking about, 
What did he say? Did he say anything helpful? Well, maybe not from our point of view, perhaps. He blamed the smallpox, the horrible eruptions on the skin, on putrefying and fermenting of the blood. So you can see that despite the fact he wasn't a Hippocratic, he didn't come from the ancient world in, in Greece and Italy, nevertheless he had this same idea about the body kind of turning on itself, as it were. He didn't do any experiments to show this, of course he didn't. It was much more a theoretical idea. He got the idea that if people became flushed, if, their temper if they were hot, then the blood must have been heating up, just very similar to what the Hippocratics thought, and the fermenting meant that it was kind of going bad in some kind of way. So this blood in your body goes bad and it comes out in kind of pustules all over you with this disgusting stuff that comes out of it. Sounds sort of logical if you believe in that kind of thing. He also said, and this was quite perceptive as it turns out, and perhaps more useful than the first one, it was very common in the young much commoner than in older people, and we'll go on in a moment or two to see why. To see why these cycles of what we would call infectious disease hit young people who plainly don't have a natural immunity, but he didn't understand that then. It was just a, um, an observation, but a useful one. Okay, so did anybody suggest there was anything they could do about it? Here's a, an very old picture of some people suffering from something. <laughs> to be honest, we're not quite sure what it was. It could have been smallpox, as you can see the eruptions. But as you know from now, uh, from our previous lectures, other diseases could cause these kind of eruptions as well. But plainly, these were bad ones, as you can see um, from the people here. So any cures in the West? Well, yes. Some helpful people did suggest that if the blood had gone wrong, um, perhaps if you put the patients in a closed room with heat, which you'd think would be counterintuitive, wouldn't you? If your blood had got too hot, you were too hot, a hot room. But the idea was you could kind of, to put it very basically, sweat it out, as it were. The evil humours would sweat out of your body. So that was the notion behind this, um, although plainly patients were already overheated. Did this work? Well, as with anything, whatever cure you try for something, on some people it will be successful, possibly just because they get better by themselves. But if enough of them do that, then it becomes passed on as a useful thing to do. The trouble was, if you were a poor person who didn't have much of the way in a house or even a room to live in, Plainly, closing the room and covering yourself with lots of warm coverings and clothes just wasn't possible. You didn't have them in the first place. So again, more poor people died, even if this wasn't a terribly helpful thing to do. However, this disease, as we call it nowadays, they didn't call it that then, was on the change. It was referred to early on, you can see by its Latin title, variola minor, in other words, the the eruptions, the skin eruptions, minor, small, in other words, a small problem, to becoming variola major, big, major, Latin for big. So something happened in the 16th century, um, world, not just in Europe, but apparently um, in con other countries that we knew about, to make this a much, much bigger problem. We're never sure what happens with these variations in what we call disease. Um, it's a kind of refreshing of it. Often if it's gone away for a little while, then it comes back and it hits what they used to call a virgin population. In other words, a population that hasn't suffered from it. Then it looks worse because they don't have the natural immunity. But we're not really sure why. It's too far back to trace it, really. So what happened in this period? Well, there was an attempt for prevention. Can't do the cure, why not try the prevention? Here's a rather idealized, again, Eastern picture, probably from the 19th century. Here was actually a much more practical idea, not from the West, but from the East. If children had this problem, remember they didn't talk about catching diseases so much, but if they had this problem more, why not expose the children to the mildest cases 
Here was the common sense idea, which I talked to you about in a previous lecture, that some diseases were plainly passed on from person to person. They didn't really know how, but it was perfectly obvious. We'll come back to that in a minute. So if that's the case, why not give them to children who seem to not suffer quite so badly? Um, they'd get it over with, and maybe that would mean they'd never get it again, because that was another thing that was often noticed. This was not medical people who were talking about this. This was just ordinary people, common sense. So... They did something that we might not automatically think of, passing on um, an infection from one person to another. They would get somebody who had already had smallpox, we assume it was. You get pustules all over your skin, provided you survive, they eventually dry up. And what you get is kind of dried matter in them. So they would take the dried matter from the pustules and they would make a little scrape in the skin. Oh, it's, first of all, they would blow it up the nose. I forgot about that bit. Um, that's an, an easy orifice, shall we say, to blow into without too much disruption to, um, to the rest of your body, as it were. So blowing dried matter up the nostrils was the first way of doing it. The second, slightly more sophisticated way, was to make a little shallow scratch on the skin and insert the dried pustule matter underneath that. Um, did that work? Well, nobody did controlled trials, so we're not really very sure. People went on doing this right until the 19th century, so it must have been reasonably successful. What they hoped for doing these, I, these particular procedures was one of two things. Either you would get a local reaction on the skin, like you do with some immunizations these days, but just a local one, just a small local one that wouldn't bother you all that much and it would go away. The second best thing for a child, if they were doing it to a child, would be to just get a very mild case. So you might get a few pustules, be a bit sick, but recover. And generally then, people didn't get it again. So that was the best outcome. Sadly, of course, as we'll see later, that wasn't always the outcome because it wasn't very um, well thought out, really, and sometimes people got a much, much heavier dose of the disease than they were supposed to do. That was the problem. Okay, moving on, back to Europe. Um, famous people, this was not a disease that was a class-conscious disease. Many diseases, it used to be claimed, were worse for the poor than it was for the rich, not this one. It knew no class barriers. Just to mention a couple of famous people, although there were plenty. Um, queen Mary in England, a queen who was reigning in the 17th century, um, jointly with her husband. That actually made her quite usual, unusual in that period. Um, she got smallpox. She was supposedly, although she's a queen, and you know how they always come up with good, impressive-sounding stories about queens. But this has been backed up, so maybe it's true. According to the story, Queen Mary realized she was suffering from smallpox and shut herself away and said, no, I realize, see this shows that people realized it was passed on. Shut herself away in a room, perhaps with heat and lots of clothes and things, and insisted that her maids of honor, everybody else around the court, her husband, should keep away from her. Well, she may have done, but if she, whatever she did, she died, unfortunately. So even with the best medical care at the time, it didn't save her. That's why it's quite useful talking about well-known people. We might say, well, that's a bit elitist, isn't it? Never mind all the poor people who died. But what that tells you is, if somebody dies of a particular problem who's very high profile, they will almost inevitably have had the best medical treatment at the time. And if that can't save them, then there's probably not much hope for anybody else. Another uh, person who got smallpox was Louis XV of France, into the next century, king just before the French Revolution. Um, again, a bit like the story I told you the other day about the First World War, smallpox may have caused the French Revolution. Who knows? A whole lot of Louis's family were actually wiped out by smallpox. Somehow or other, he managed to survive. Who knows why? And he was actually survived by his, either his grandson or his great-grandson. I can't remember which one it was. Louis XVI, who was certainly not 
a very good ruler and certainly wasn't prepared to come to the throne and under him, guess what broke out? The French Revolution. <laughs> so it might be a little pushing it to um, attribute the French Revolution to smallpox, but it certainly had an effect on world affairs. It was that important. Okay, moving on. East makes West. 18th century, who's this woman and what's she got to do with it? She's a lady who actually should be quite famous. She deserves to be, not as famous as she might be. Kind of bringing in some women as well. Lady Mary Wortley Montague, a British aristocrat. She's the one who joins up East and West in a rather unlikely way. Her husband is sent as an ambassador to one of the Eastern countries. She goes with him, with her family. And while she's there... She hears about their practice of inoculation, as they call it now. In other words, the scratch on the skin and the putting the smallpox matter under the skin. And she quite bravely has her own children inoculated because, after all, she's in an area where this problem is rife. Um, she obviously sees this as a good thing to do. Um, however, <laughs> perhaps it wasn't quite as brave as it sounds because, in fact, what was done, um, either we're not sure before or after she had her children inoculated, there was what we might refer to as a controlled trial of this inoculation in England. I've got it in scare quotes, because it certainly wasn't a controlled trial. What did they do? The authorities in England took some condemned prisoners, in prison condemned to death, plenty of them in the 18th century, and so the story goes, tried out the smallpox inoculation on them. They were told, okay, you're going to be hanged anyway. Why not have a go with this? If you are, we'll commute your sentence to life, or maybe you'll only be sent to Australia, something like that. So apparently they agreed. Whether they agreed or not, they probably got it. It turned out to be relatively, relatively successful. And as a result, we're getting the swap over here from lay medicine and grassroots medicine into medical areas, much more um, organized medical areas. This inoculation is reported at a meeting of the Royal Society. Royal Society still exists in London today, where they report important medical and scientific discoveries. And in 1714, they discuss the inoculation, and important papers are written on it. So now it's moved into the realm of um, academic medicine, as we'll see in a minute or two. But it never quite does. We'll see how. Okay. By the 1740s, there was improved inoculation. Better way of doing it. Slightly. Not much. Um, a shallower scratch, and we'll see why in a minute. Basically, to give a more localized and, look, and milder reaction. So more chance of just having a local reaction, the shallower you made the scratch. And how was this done? This still wasn't really medical. It was still a lay practice. Lay inoculators, in other words, mainly men, I think there were women as well, though, who didn't have medical qualifications, would go round to country and urban centers and inoculate the population, mainly children. And how did they advertise this? They advertised it in the local press. Here's a local paper, which were just beginning to get going in the 18th century. So a really good way of putting up public notices. In your local paper, which you got every week or whatever, um, it would say, Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so, the lay inoculator, will be in your marketplace or in your town hall on Saturday next week. Bring along your children to be inoculated um, and save our district from the horrors of the speckled monster. Well, I don't know if they did say that, but something like that. So, did that work? Hmm. Not altogether. In fact, there was some claim that these lay inoculators, well-meaning though they were, were actually spreading the disease rather than controlling it. 
and there did seem to be a bit of an element of failure of protection. So this was a bit of a problem. Doing it on a large scale, for some reason, didn't seem to work quite so well. And we'll see there are other reasons when we come on to objections. Objections to inoculation and vaccination are not new. They're just different ones. So we'll see what the problem was in a minute. Okay, if this inoculating is not working, what do you do? Remember what always happens? You go from panacea, the quick fix, the inoculation, back to hygiene, the public health approach, cleanliness. So that's exactly what happens. Lay people and medical people start looking around in the 18th century. This is just a picture from Britain, but nowhere in the 18th century was very wonderful. It really, really wasn't a good century to live. If you could send yourself back into the past, this would not be the century to pick, definitely. So, as I've said, failure of panacea, how about a rediscovery of hygiene? but a really, really bad time to do it. Because that would involve familiar to us today, except it was much worse then, cleaning up the environment. And look, here's a picture from a cartoon, admittedly, so it's exaggerated, but not very, from London in the middle of the 18th century. Everybody's drunk. Um, this lady woman is so drunk that her baby's falling over there. Um, she's obviously got some horrible disease because she's got all these marks on her leg. That man is starving there. Um, there's all kinds of horrible things going on. In, people are gnawing on bones because of dogs' bones because they're so hungry. Uh, bodies are being put in barrows to wheel them away. Probably it was never quite as bad as this. This is a bit like a composite picture. But nevertheless, because so many people worldwide in this period had moved from the countryside villages, little villages, into cities with very little infrastructure, the environment of the cities was absolutely horrible. And so it was a very long-term goal to clear it up. If you wanted to get rid of smallpox, the clearing up approach was going to take a very long time. Moreover, here's where we start getting the poor blamed for being a threat to society. They're going to be a reservoir of disease. And as we know, this is in fact not true because smallpox didn't really um, target particular classes. Nevertheless, they very often didn't have such good treatment, they didn't have such good living conditions, so of course they suffered from it more. So they're seen as being a bit of a threat to the rest of society. Just a few more social things before we get on to what happened with the medical bit. Um, health in the 18th century in the upper classes was pretty good. Look how posh they look there living in their lovely houses with their nice new clothes and their lovely furniture. Um, the urbanized middle classes are on the up. They're upwardly mobile and they're aspirational, as we would call them these days. They've also become fairly secular, not so religious. They have, they're not unlike us in many ways. They have very high expectations of their health. Sadly, not going to be realized all that much, but nevertheless, they have the expectations. And they're rational and providential. That means that, supposedly, they think logically. And they also think, which is perhaps more important than the logical thing, they're in charge of their own destiny. So they think through things. They think, we don't want to have horrible diseases. This is not what our lifestyle encompasses. What can we personally do by our own efforts to prevent ourselves from getting disease. Let's not just pray, let's not send up you know, exhortations to God or the saints or whatever. We can do it by our, our own efforts. And they do try. Because in fact, not that we've got time to go into this now, but one of the big projects in the 18th century was the building of hospitals to cure people. But there was another one. Because disease still threatened, all of them, unfortunately. So, got the great pox and the small pox still hovering around, variola minor, variola major. And it's what I called the other day and the other week in the lecture, contingently contagious. Remember that meant everybody by now recognized it was passed on from person to person. 
They just didn't quite know how, because they couldn't really see the particular virus that was being passed on, obviously. But these diseases that came out in facial disfiguration, bodily disfiguration, were very stigmatizing, literally. People could see how you looked, and it wasn't good. To put a very minor point, um, it ruined reputations. Um, men and girls, men and women, could be stigmatized for having, for example, remember venereal disease, which would cause the horrible stigmata on your face. But it could also be smallpox. And somehow or other, smallpox got sort of a bit wrapped up with the venereal disease thing, although it wasn't the same thing, and it plainly wasn't passed on the same way. Nevertheless, this whole thing about pustules on your body just wasn't good. Um, as far as women were concerned, and some men, of course, um, they also literally had ruined beauty. Um, it was claimed that the face of somebody who'd had a bad attack of smallpox, once they came out of isolation, their friends wouldn't recognize them. Their face was just so different after it had, they'd had this. So ruined beauty for women. Um, for this reason, and this picture here is actually showing an older lady, a madam of a brothel, actually, meeting the stagecoach that's coming into the city and catching the girls who are coming off it. Not so different from some of the stories we hear these days. She's getting the girls fresh from the country. The girls who won't have had smallpox, she hopes, and won't have horrible marks on their faces and so will be beautiful and so will appeal to their clients. You didn't have to be beautiful in this period. You just had not to be pockmarked. And that made you beautiful. So, what has fresh from the country got to do with it? You might think, hmm, what's going on here? Very quickly, just before we get on to that, um, disease actually became part of fashion, weirdly. The fashion for masks really took off. Because if you had an excuse like a masked ball or a, um, a Mardi Gras or something like that to wear a mask, it covered any marks on your face. And the patches. See this woman here with her patch there and her patch there. These are only little patches, but you could get much bigger ones. If you, say, just had a few marks left from the smallpox, you could cover them with these black velvet spots. And this became a big fashion statement. It was in all the fashion magazines in this period. Also, men and women started wearing a lot more makeup in this period, facial makeup to cover the depredations. Okay, on to the medical aspect. What on earth are they going to do? Here's some of the smallpox lesions. Let's see where the clue came from. Remember the girls fresh from the country? Aha! Pretty milkmaids. There were folk tales and little nursery rhymes that talked about beautiful milkmaids, the, women, the girls who milked the cows in the farms. It was claimed they always had beautiful complexions used to talk about a milkmaid's complexion. How was this? Well, it's what you might call grassroots wisdom. And somebody's about to notice this. He's about to notice that the pustules that do come out occasionally on the milkmaids and the girls fresh from the country, if they get them at all, they get them on their hands. Well, this is obviously from direct contact with the cows. So why don't they get them on the rest of their body, and why don't they get a bad attack of smallpox, at least not noticeably? There's a disease called smallpox, and this is where we get the word vaccine. Variola vaccinae, in other words, the marks, the pustules, vaccinae, of the cow. That's just French and vache, French for cow, uh, vacus, Latin for cow. So this is where your vaccine comes from. We're talking about cows. In the country, it's known there's a disease called smallpox. It often comes out on the udders of the cows that you're use, you, the girls are milking, and they get similar marks, so it's noticed, on their hat, but only on their hands. Is cowpox associated with smallpox then? And does that mean if you get, small, if you get cowpox, you don't get the smallpox? Here's the first idea that different diseases can actually be connected. 
without seeing inside somebody's body. It's come a century before that. And by common sense, not by doctors initially at all. All right, here's where academic medicine really takes over. Who do we have this time? We have Edward Jenner. I'm sure some of you must have heard of him. He's pretty famous. Uh, you can see his dates there. He um, was a country practitioner in the south of England, and this was his house. You go to the south of England, you can still see around it now. Um, pretty house. Obviously didn't make an awful lot of money, but he was comfortable being a country practitioner. Most notably, he was a pupil of John Hunter. Remember John Hunter? One of the Hunter brothers in London who set up the anatomy and surgery school. The one who did all the surgery. The one who told people, and we didn't mention this at the time, don't just think, do the experiment. People said, well, he said that because he couldn't think, because he was a bit stupid. That's not true. <laughs> he wasn't stupid. He thought you should do... Th well, you could think. Of course, you start off by thinking, obviously. But then you test it out. And so plainly, Jenner had taken him at his word. He'd remembered that. It's like you do remember some things from when you've been at university and had people going on at you about things. So he remembered. And here it is. Why not try the experiment? Well, it wasn't exactly an experiment, but he certainly took himself off to look at this issue of the milkmaids getting the pustules on their hands. And he thought, in fact, this was a real goer. Um, plainly, something was going on here. He got the notion that if he took pus pustule material from the cows, this would then result in the cowpox, not the smallpox. So here he is, and the first use of the word, vaccination. Very idealized picture, of course. Um, here he is in the Cumble Cottage. Please note the cow peering in the door, just in case you're not sure what this is about. Um, that lady is either getting ready to have her vaccination or she's already had it. Um, the baby's going to have the vaccination. Everybody's looking very, very unworried about the whole thing. Um, so this is what Jenner is doing here. But more to the point, he also wrote the book. That's what gets you the fame. Discovered in some western counties of England, particularly Gloucestershire, and known by the name of the cowpox by Edward Jenner. So he writes a book about it, about his findings. About that if you use the cowpox matter, you can probably get a local reaction and that, with any luck, will immunize people for the rest of their lives. Another way, of course, of doing that was not necessarily just to take the cowpox, but what became known as attenuated smallpox matter. In other words, diluted a bit. Don't just have it straight. That's another idea. So, this idea, for a little while, takes off. It becomes a bit fashionable. In fact, it's so fashionable that the fashionable cartoonist at the time draws a cartoon about it. And here's Jenna with his um, vaccinations. Here's the boy holding all his stuff that he's going to get the pustule material from. Here's a lady not looking very impressed. But look what's happened to the people who've already been vaccinated. They've got cows growing out their arms. He's got a cow growing out his mouth, this one. Plainly, that didn't happen. But people were not terribly impressed by the fact this was associated with cows, with farmyard stuff. And how do we really know what's going into this vaccination material? They're quite frankly a bit suspicious about the whole thing, and maybe rightly so. We might not think people are correct to be suspicious nowadays, but yeah, back then they probably were. Let's see why. Here's a few reasons. Here's some poor children. So it was the poor who were mainly suspicious. Um, they were worried, quite rightly, about contamination. In other words, the needles that were used to make the marks on the skin weren't cleaned. They weren't, certainly weren't sterilized between vaccinations. So you were quite likely to spread other diseases. That was a problem. There were side effects. Yes, there were. It didn't always prevent smallpox. And if it did prevent perhaps worse smallpox, it didn't always prevent it at all. And the poor in the cities were certainly still most at risk, but they were least likely to be vaccinated. So, the poor remained a source of infection, supposedly. 
and a threat to others. Here's some poor little children not looking very much like a threat. So it was a possibility vaccination. It certainly wasn't compulsory. Um, it did work to a certain extent, but plainly there was a lot of work still to be done on it. We're about to hear very quickly a bit more of a success story. Strangely enough, not in Europe or the rest of the world, but in Australia. 18th and early 19th century happens to be the period where the prisoners, remember the ones who were being vaccinated against their will, they were likely to be sent off to Australia. Why? Well, we all know the story about that. All the prisons are too full. They've, the, the penal code has put so many people in prison there isn't room. Initially, they put them in boats, in harbors and rivers. They overflow. So you're going to send them somewhere. Where are you going to send them? Not America? Oh, no. They've had their war of independence, so you can't send them there anymore. Let's send them a long way away. So Australia is about as far as you can get. Unfortunately, the convicts and later on some free settlers traveled to Australia by ship. Here's some of the very difficult circumstances that they went through. Smallpox was often referred to as the invisible invader. For reasons that are often forgotten about, it was an unfortunate period to be sending people across the world. Not so much because they were awful, because most of them weren't particularly awful at all. They were just ordinary people. But they did bring smallpox with them. And smallpox, unfortunately, survived the voyage. Some diseases don't. That's why we've never had, for example, cholera in Australia. But smallpox did. So what was set up very, very early on in Sydney was a vaccine institute. Vaccine was brought out. Live vaccine was brought by ships, keeping refreshing it from Europe. And by the 1840s, when Sydney was a city, they set up a vaccine institute. Unfortunately, by that time, the contagion had already, the infection as we'd call it now, had already spread. Spread throughout a lot of people who were traveling, but of course, particularly the Aboriginal population, because unsurprisingly, they hadn't suffered from it. So they were definitely what we call a virgin population. They traveled, they moved around a lot. As they moved around a lot, they took the smallpox with them. There are actually maps, there were books that were published in 20th century that show the progress of smallpox from the coast, east coast, over to the west coast, and then back again. You can actually trace its, its journey, if you like to call it that. Okay. Panic, fear, and xenophobia. When did that happen? In Sydney, in 1881. It wasn't a very good time to live in Sydney, quite honestly. It was a growing city. It was, you know, looking quite good, but it had very, very unfortunate slums in the hinterland, as it were. And what's about to appear in Sydney is the smallpox. It's gone over to the west coast, and it's come right back again. And by 1881, it arrives in Sydney. Here's a cartoon from a magazine at the time um, showing what happened in Sydney in this period. Um, here's a, a doctor. You can tell he's a doctor by his top hat. He's a fashionable physician. He's immunizing somebody's arm through a fence. They've just put their arm through the fence. This is a very... Um, rude comment, impolite comment on doctors who didn't want to go near people who hadn't been immunized against smallpox. Um, here's stupid policemen. The policemen were always being depicted as stupid. Um, they're chasing a pig that they think the pig has smallpox. That's why they're so stupid. Um, here's a doctor. Now that you can see by his striped trousers and his top hat, he's being chased down the street because nobody thinks he's much use. Um, and here's a man who's actually drunk and clinging on to a lamppost, but the stupid policeman again thinks he has smallpox because he's drunk. Uh, and a Chinese person being, being thrown out of his lodging because um, the, the silly landlady thinks he's got smallpox. So it's like fear and loathing. Everybody's scared of smallpox. Did they have a reason for that? Well, yes and no. It was a nasty disease. Here's a picture of Sydney in that period round right about the rocks area. You can see it doesn't look much like that now. Um, actually, in Sydney, there were a total of 154 cases, hardly massive. 
We certainly wouldn't call it an epidemic. Um, the death rate, if you're interested, was 25.9, very specific. Um, again, fairly small. But Sydney absolutely panicked. There were headlines in the paper, the Sydney paper, saying things like, actor at Her Majesty's Theatre collapses with smallpox. Um, bank teller in the bank collapses with smallpox. Um, they were the ones, the high-profile ones, as it were. Most people who got it actually seemed to get better, and there weren't many people who got it in the first place. But Sir Henry Park, you may have heard of him, the man with the great long beard, he set up a board of health. First time they'd ever done that in Sydney. Maybe not such a bad idea. Why? Because it gave municipal powers. Here's the first the start of... The state, which is not a state yet, it's still a colony, of course, but having power over people's lives. Before that, they're not so fast. You know, live however you want, as long as you don't make a nuisance of yourself, in which case you'll be thrown in prison. This is saying smallpox is a menace. We have to go around and disinfect residences. And you'll be unsurprised to hear that the residences that were mainly disinfected were the residences of the poor. Good luck with getting into the middle class houses to do any disinfecting. The argument was that it was mainly then who were suffering from it. Um, 3,000 gallons of carbolic acid, uh, which was actually the, the um, stuff that was used in surgery at the time, uh, was ordered from London in order to splash around people's houses. You can imagine how delighted they were with that. Not very. But they had no choice. Once he'd set up the Board of Health, this was draconian. He could do it. Okay, finishing off. Results of this, Sir Henry and his Board of Health in Sydney. Um, they isolated patients in their own homes. That was not easy to police, quite frankly. But what it did was it set neighbours against neighbours. They told neighbours to spy on their neighbours to see if they were coming out, if, they'd been, if there was a possibility they might be suffering from smallpox. If people couldn't be isolated in their own homes, what did they do with them? Oh, they took them over to North Head Quarantine Station, which you can still see these days if, if you want. You can go around it. Mainly people off ships came there, but they used it as a quarantine station and kept people there. Again, very few people actually suffering from smallpox. In fact, the papers, I suppose the 19th century equivalent, say, of the Telegraph, got onto this kind of thing and claimed that everybody at North Head Quarantine Station was having a wonderful time, um, all on the taxpayer's expense. Of course they weren't. They were, they were having a miserable time. And in those days, if you took, say, the man away from his family, the family didn't have any income and there was no welfare to fall back on. So it was a pretty draconian thing to do to get rid of a very, very small risk of smallpox. But it shows how scared people were of it. They really were. Um, it also led, I suppose you could say this was perhaps a better um, situation, the establishment of the coast hospital at Little Bay. You know where Little Bay is, right out through Maroubra and Malabar and out to the, the coast there. Later on, during the First World War, it was used as a rehabilitation hospital by then called Prince Henry Hospital. And if you go out there now, you'll see, you can still see old buildings like that. They've kept the heritage buildings. But there's a whole like, um, housing development out there of very expensive housing because, of course, it's got beautiful views right over the water. Um, I don't suppose people at the Coast Hospital who were forced in there with smallpox were particularly looking at the view. Okay, moving on then. End of the story. Hmm, is it? Question mark. In the 20th century, worldwide, grassroots vaccination campaigns came back again. So back to the grassroots, not from a medical centre, but from lay vaccinators. Here you can see one, vaccinating small groups of people in towns and villages. By 1966, we've leapt ahead a bit here, as you can see, um, mass smallpox vaccination campaign under the World Health Organization, which had been set up after the Second World War. Um, really, really mass campaign of lay vaccinators, vaccinating people all over the place. Supposedly, the lay vaccinators made people perhaps happier to be vaccinated. They didn't feel um, so suspicious. It was people they knew, or at least could relate to, who were doing this. Was that successful? 
Well, smallpox was declared eradicated by 1974, officially. Sounds pretty good. Um, so are we finishing here with a success story? Because nobody wants to get smallpox, believe you me. Yes and no. It's always like that, isn't it? Not quite the end. What do we have here? 1978, a few years later, death of a lab worker in Birmingham where the virus had been kept. We know now smallpox, well, our current idea is that smallpox uh, originates from a virus that gets into the body. The virus was kept, just in case. We think in Russia, although nobody's too sure about that one, but certainly in Birmingham. And there was death of a lab worker from what looked very like smallpox. Exactly how that happened, we're not completely sure. So, there was a big ethical campaign about whether or not the virus should actually be destroyed. It was an ethical and medical dilemma. Because people were beginning to realize that there was actually an intertwining of diseases. And that sometimes if you got one disease, horrible though it might be, it actually protected you later in life from another one. And there was beginning to be a feeling that perhaps the autoimmune diseases that happen sometimes later in life, particularly the really nasty rheumatoid arthritis, things like that, might in some way be associated with having had infectious diseases when you were younger and your body having fought it off. That's a very simplistic description of it. But there was a suggestion that this might be the case, in which case there was a great reluctance to actually destroy um, the virus that had caused this admittedly horrible disease. So, finishing off then, currently in Australia, where are we? No smallpox, well, not as far as we know, anyway. Um, infectious diseases are at a pretty low rate in the general population. Why is that? Well, of course, there are different variations on that one. One idea says, well, it's just because we have a really good lifestyle in Australia. People are pretty healthy, they have fairly good living conditions. Um, it's, the, it's the Hygieia one, isn't it? You can keep most diseases at bay, provided people are healthy, uh, eat well, don't drink too much, have healthy living conditions, etc. Or is it due to the immunization? Because pretty well, um, most of the children, and remember we're back to the notion that it's children who get it, um, have been vaccinated. But gradually there was a suggestion that not all children were actually being vaccinated. And of course the argument here was, partly, partly, that Hygieia had been weirdly too successful. In other words, everybody was living such a healthy lifestyle that they'd forgotten what these horrible infectious diseases were like. Nobody remembered them anymore. Even when you, presumably, when you saw that smallpox one I put up in the beginning, to most people, that was a bit of a shock. It is to us, on the whole, unless we've traveled a lot to other countries. So this is where the anti-vaccination campaigns here, I make no comment on them, I just tell you what there is. Um, people say it's an individual decision, but the trouble with that is, um, well, does that mean there should be direct or indirect compulsion on people to have children vaccinated? If they're not vaccinated, we lose the whole point of it. That's the trouble. Because there's this whole notion of herd immunity. You've got to have enough people with that to make it um, a possibility. You just can't have the odd person here and there. It doesn't work like that. So the argument against that is, of course, that we've all got natural immunity. So you don't need to worry about that kind of thing. But I would say the more important point to get out of this is that, a bit like the 18th century, we have very high expectations these days of our health. And quite frankly, I don't see people in Australia being very happy with having, well, a bit of a mild dose of smallpox or maybe not too bad of this or maybe a bit of cholera or maybe... People don't really want this in our kind of lifestyle. I would say that would be more an argument against keeping yourself protected if, if that was your idea. So a success story, but still one that's being talked about, and perhaps we haven't quite come to the end of this one yet. Doing this in a few more years, we might well be saying different things.